So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the day. Um, Dr. Gloria White Hammond um, has accomplishments and credentials that I think could potentially take an hour for me to, to detail for you. So even though I know her quite well, I decided that I better write some notes so that I don't um, use the entire time that is allotted for her speech, uh, giving her introduction. So um, among her many titles that she wears, she's a pediatrician, a pastor, humanitarian, advocate for social justice, and community leader. These are only a handful of the titles by which one can describe Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond. I should add to this list, of course, that she is also advisor to presidents, both presidents of universities, as well as uh, presidents of medical centers, such as um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where she served for many years as uh, a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, and as you know, of course, she's uh, on the Board of Trustees um, for Tufts University. But when I talk about presidents, I should also add that she's advisor to presidents, presidents of the United States, presidents of, of, of foreign nations. And I'm sure that as you hear her work, you're going to begin to appreciate um, the wisdom and depth that she has that she brings to all of these hats that she wears. Her credentials are impressive. She's a graduate of Boston University, uh, Tufts University School of Medicine right here. Uh, she completed a residency uh, in pediatrics before she began her practice um, at a uh, neighborhood um, community health center uh, called South Coast Community Health Center. And there she um, um, served some of the most vulnerable uh, families in the Boston uh, community. Um, she's um, practiced for 27 years before she retired in 2008. And retirement is actually, I think it's a, um, a, a misnomer for what she did, actually. <laughs> she got busy after that. Um, during her tenure as, um, at the um, community health center, she began to appreciate the challenge of teenage pregnancies. And, and that was the inspiration for her founding Do the Right Thing. Uh, which provided at-risk adolescent uh, girls access to um, an outlet through creative writing, but also to important mentoring, which you hopefully could uh, help uh, save off some of the um, inevitable uh, risks that, that, that they might fall prey to. Twenty-five years ago, uh, Reverend Dr. White Hammond, along with her husband, Dr. Ray Hammond, who is a graduate of Harvard Medical School, decided to co-found Bethel AME Church in Boston, and I'm proud to say that I'm a member of that church community. And together, they have not only served the faith community, but served Boston as a whole. Uh, it was also um, during the course of her co-pastoring uh, this church that um, Gloria decided to go back to school and, and so now holds a master's uh, in divinity from, from Harvard. Just about 13 years ago, Dr. Uh, Gloria Wadhaman decided to put, bring her considerable expertise to uh, shed light on an issue that at that time actually had very um, little um, press in this country, and that was slavery in war-torn Sudan. She, uh, since 2001, has made numerous trips to southern Sudan and to Darfur, and as a result of her work has brought not only lied to this issue, but served as an advisor to the president, to then president, President Clinton, uh, in trying to formulate a policy reg with regards to uh, Southern Sudan. She founded My Sister's Keeper, which is a, a women-led humanitarian and human rights initiative uh, that partners with Sudanese women of all backgrounds and all faiths in their efforts towards reconciliation and reconstruction once the Civil War ended. The group is deeply committed to uh, uh, sustainable peace and have been doing so through uh, the creation of a girls' school, the first of its kind in, in South Sudan, um, um, as well as collaborating with uh, folks from different race, religion, ethnicity, geography. In fact, one of the groups with whom she works is the, um, uh, a local uh, synagogue uh, with um, her Jewish uh, colleagues have worked together with the Sudanese uh, women in, in beginning this painful um, effort to rebuild a nation after it's been war torn for over 20 years. Perhaps her, uh, one, one of the things that she's most proud of, she will tell you, is, is in fact the fact that the girls' school 
within a short period of time grew from 100 girls to over 550 girls. From my standpoint, though, the most important thing I can tell you about um, Reverend Dr. Glory White Hammond is the fact that she's a friend, she's my pastor, and she's my prayer partner. It turns out that if you're Gloria's prayer partner, you find yourself praying for governors and presidents regardless of their party affiliations. So I learned very quickly the importance of praying for our leaders, uh, no matter where they came from. But we also prayed over the years for uh, personal uh, and family uh, issues, and I would say for uh, most relevant to this audience, um, Gloria was uh, key in providing me with the support and counsel as I was trying to uh, muster the courage to leave an institution where I had been for over 20 years to take this position here at Tufts. And so we, uh, I also owe her for my being here today. So without much ado, I am delighted and honored to introduce to you my friend, my mentor, my prayer partner, Reverend Dr. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for the privilege of being here. Um, wow, Joyce, what an intro. Uh, at the end of the day, what really matters is that I'm one of you. I get you. I understand what makes you tick. And so I am here uh, not as someone who's on the outside, but someone who's very much on the inside. Um, so let's see. If we, we'll leave it right there. And you can close the other ones. Okay, good. So um, as, as Joyce has said, uh, and again, thank yous, lots of thank yous. Thank yous, first of all, to Dean, uh, Dean Harris, uh, my good friend Harris. He's the one who, who called me up and said, would you, could you? Uh, and, and then I want to thank Micaiah, who was so faithful in staying after me. This man is tenacious. If y'all can't get some money with Micaiah on your case, you just can't get money. Uh, so... <laughs> So thank you again for the privilege of being here. Again, as Joyce has said, it's been my uh, privilege, especially in the last um, 10 years, to make multiple trips to uh, war-torn Sudan and South Sudan. And as you know, it is one of the poorest and, uh, and most conflict-ridden uh, countries in the world. It was eight years ago that our country declared the situation there uh, consistent with the genocide. And at the time, the United Nations also considered it a humanitarian crisis. As Joyce said, am I working with this mic or with this mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and, and as uh, Joyce said, I initially went over to look at the issue of trafficking uh, and then recognized that there was an even broader issue in terms of the conflict and some systemic changes. And so that began my work as an advocate, something that I had never done before. I would say that for most of my life I have followed the rules. Uh, I've lived inside the box. I never colored outside of the lines because that's the only way to get into medical school. Yeah. So uh, for me to be in the midst of this situation and taking on a role as advocate and speaking uh, truth to power was, um, was something that was distinctly unusual for me. Uh, over the years that I have traveled into Sudan and South Sudan, I will say that there have been many, many difficult moments. But one of the most poignant was um, in a village uh, in uh, the northern part of South Sudan, just on the border of Darfur. Uh, there were tens of thousands of people were fleeing the killing and the raping and the maiming and the burning, uh, and ended up setting up a makeshift uh, humanitarian camp, if you will, in that northern part of South Sudan. Uh, they were without any kind of formal humanitarian services. So when I arrived to do my human rights work and to do this uh, work of, uh, this very fancy work of, of supporting an underground railroad to actually free uh, primarily women from enslavement, uh, I did not go in my capacity as a doctor. Uh, you can imagine my dismay when I encountered this three-week-old boy. Uh, his eyes, as you can see, were quite shrunken, his skin mottled and shriveled, and it was certainly classic dehydration. His pulse was rapid and thread-like, breathing shallow. And I could not understand the words that his mother spoke, but I certainly could clearly translate the sense of desperation in her eyes. For over a week, the child had experienced vomiting and diarrhea. We know what that is. Uh, and now he was literally at death's doorstep, and so she came to see the well-trained Western doctor from America. 
uh, I did not come again in my role as a physician. And so with uh, only a first aid uh, Walgreens kit um, at my disposal, I watched this child uh, and wrestled to reconcile the reality that he was going to die on my watch. That is certainly, um, and how do I, I'm going to turn this, I can leave it on, it's okay. That is certainly um, a situation that many of you know about. You have been there, you have done that, you know of what I speak. While most of the people walking down Harrison Avenue even now, uh, while most of the funders sitting in their corner offices, or the donors on Wall Street, or the congressmen uh, in the hallowed halls of Congress become even more hollow, <laughs> While most of them can afford the objectivity of simply seeing the numbers on a page, you are they who have seen the statistics up close and personal. These are the people that keep you up at night. This is the passion that makes you think and tick. And the reality is, is that for most Americans, they do not appreciate your work in the world over there. You've heard the refrain, we have so many problems over here. Why expend our time, our talents, our treasures over there? So more than anything, I just stopped by to tell you that you are very much on the right track. Do not be discouraged and do what your mother used to tell you when at the end of asking you, begging you, imploring you to simply do the things she wanted you to do. No ifs, no ands, no buts, just do it. And in that sense, this uh, Tufts Global um, Health Center Collaborative, Health Collaborative, is very much on track. Not only because it's the righteous thing to do, and that's my language as the, the, the person who gets paid to, uh, to have faith. <laughs> Not only because it's the righteous thing to do in the context of our common humanity, but the reality is it's the right thing to do pragmatically in the context of our shrunken world. Martin Luther King's final book is entitled, Why We Can't Wait. And I, I would say that if I had to do a subtitle for this talk today, it is Why We Can't Wait. In his final book, he uh, ends with these words. He says, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. And he concludes over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of many generations and civilizations are written the pathetic word, too late. The recent Ebola crisis and the HIV AIDS crisis before that have demonstrated not just the relevance of your work for tomorrow, but the urgency of your work for today. And so that requires you to do some work of advocacy. Again, I, that was not the thing that I was trained to do. I had never sent an email prior to my getting involved in this cause. But when I realized that it required more than simply doing the work, it required speaking the truth to powers, I became an advocate, fiercely an advocate. The truth is that while you have no shortage of ideas and creativity and resourcefulness, finding the funding is a major challenge. Traditional sources of funding don't always get it. Research funding, for example, the NIH-type funding, is often too focused on hypothesis-based, workbench-type research in controlled environments. Program funding, for example, from USAID, is often too broad with little emphasis on evaluating impact. Over 60 years of this type of funding has resulted in impact that is not commensurate with the cumulative funding, resources, and intellectual input that has been invested. More often than not, the funding set aside for these populations does not reach the target population at all. 
In cases where a relatively rapid response is desired, funding agencies take decades to eventually embrace the problem, and this was certainly seen most recently with the Ebola epidemic. That's why today not only represents a time to confer, but as uh, Boris said, it's also a time to celebrate. Tufts University research in the global health forefront has spanned two, uh, two decades in four continents. However, often that research has been done in silos. And so as part of the strategy to overcome the above challenges, Tufts set up this center to coordinate the work efforts of Tufts to become more efficient in operations, collaborations, internal and external, to transition to projects and programs that make an impact over and above conducting research and improve the visibility of Tufts, not only here, but around the world. And so I'm confident that at the end of the day, you're going to arrive at what has been a very provocative interaction. And then it will be time to go out and do the work. And here's the deal. It's hard work. And it's very easy to get weary in well-doing. And so I want to, again, commend to you that thing that your mother said. Just do it. In the black church tradition, our ancestors sang a song, I don't feel no ways tired. And so when trouble would not only come knocking, but would move on in and stay a little while, Big Mama would sing, I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. And so I've developed now in the course of doing my work, especially in Sudan and South Sudan, the top five reasons why we cannot be no ways tired and just do it. And I know that those are double negatives, but we're speaking Ebonics today. The fifth reason, we'll go from five to one. The fifth reason is the crises in the countries in which you are working are chronic. You didn't get here overnight and finding the way out is not going to be an overnight process. But I'll point to the wisdom that I learned uh, this summer when I was climbing Kilimanjaro. I had a good friend who um, had bilateral knee replacements, and um, one of her goals for recovering was to do something outrageous. And so just to climb, just the idea of climbing was outrageous, but then the second outrageous thing that she did was to invite 14 of her friends. And the third outrageous thing was that my husband thought it was a capital idea. And so uh, lest the man go climbing up the mountain and die without me being able to say I was present when he took his last gasping breath, <laughs> I decided to go along for the ride. It was the hardest thing that I've ever done. The primary uh, uh, cause that people don't finish it is because they experience altitude sickness. You know, the pulmonary and cerebral edema associated with altitude sickness. Uh, we were going to be doing this over um, nine days, seven days for the ascent. Um, I was not particularly interested because I knew that, in general, the statistics for uh, successfully summiting Kilimanjaro were around 50%. I, I don't ever understand why anyone would work with those kinds of odds. Um, but when I went to the orientation, they reassured me that the approach that they take over seven days is, ensures that there are 95% uh, success rate. And in fact, they said, well, there was a 70-year-old woman who just two weeks ago completed the trip. Well, I know that I'm not 70 years old, so I figured, well, if she could do it, I could do it as well. It was so hard. And I knew that I was in trouble on day one when the group started out, and I started in the middle of the pack, and within an hour or so found myself at the very back. And so I was rushing to catch up, and my guide said to me, no, Gloria, that, that's not the way you climb this mountain. And he showed me how you do it. He says that it's, gotta, it's, it's, not, it's not one of these races. In fact, he said the people who are least likely to climb are athletes, young athletes, who think that they can do anything. And so he said the way you do it is pole, pole. That's Swahili for, for slowly, slowly. A and the gait goes like this.
And that's how you get all the way up the mountain, pole, pole. Well, I made it up the mountain, but it occurred to me um, as I was doing that that so much of our work is at that pace. Given the chronicity, given the complexity, so much of it is pole, pole. And so part of being an outstanding research is to be patient with the process. The fifth, fourth reason that is not only our, our issues are the, that we're working in chronic, but they're also very complex. Um, the health problems are often uh, more intense and more burdensome in the context in which you're working. Whether you're working in Makaya's home in rural Kenya, or Honorine's lab in the urban slum in South India, or Ordelia's site in Panama, the settings are rife with such complicating factors as extreme poverty and poor human rights standards, poor governance, illiteracy, and high levels of insecurity. And so the sense that we ought to be able to do this quick and in a hurry simply is not the case. And also points, I believe, to the importance of also being advocates for the countries in which these, uh, which are often plagued by such significant ills. Thirdly, we've seen hard times before. Much of our experience in medical school is learning about the successes, the situations that seem like such conundrums in our past, but on which we've made progress. We're going to see that with Ebola. Last night I had an opportunity to hear President Jimmy Carter speak about his latest book, A Call to Action, Women, Religion, violence and power. He is 90 years old now. Since 1986, the Carter Center has led the international campaign to eradicate the Guinea worm disease, working closely with ministries of health and local communities, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and many others. You certainly know now that Guinea worm is set, having done this work now for 20 years almost, most is said to become the second human disease in history after smallpox to be eradicated. When they began the work in 1986, the incidence of Guinea worm disease had been estimated at 3.5 million. In 2013, it was estimated to be 148. President Carter says that the campaign has helped to establish village-based health delivery systems in thousands of communities around the uh, continent of Africa, and I can attest to that by my work in South Sudan. Uh, and one of the things that he will note, and I will say this not so parenthetically, is that much of this work has been done on the backs of women. And so that's another opportunity that we need to take advantage of. So we have seen bad stuff, hard stuff go down before, but when we've mobilized our efforts, we've been able to address them. The second reason, my, t my number two reason why I'm no ways tired, is because we haven't yet mobilized the diverse people and resources who are needed. That's why this collaborative center is absolutely critical. It's been said that collaboration is a series of unnatural acts between unconsenting adults. <laughs> I suspect that you can attest to that. But I will say, especially in this work of advocacy now, that there are several things that I've learned about the importance of collaboration. First, it's important to spend the time to develop relationships with people in other arenas. People who don't think like me. People who come, don't come from the same place that I come from. And my experience is that relationships and the trust that they build Usually it precedes an exchange of resources. You've got to get to know people. Second thing I've learned is that to have or develop a vision of what collaboration might look like requires us to be able to communicate our visions effectively to other people. What is it that we're doing and why are we doing it and how do we find ways to get beyond language barriers and idea barriers to be able to communicate to one another? Thirdly, someone as part of their job must take responsibility for maintaining the, the relationships and the collaborations. That's, that's part of Makaya's work, but that's also our work as well. 
Relationships require attention, right? There are many things that we can do from a distance. You can pay your bills online from a distance. You can vote online for, from a distance. Nurturing solid relationships requires being up close and personal. Thirdly, we have to hold each, uh, fourthly, we have to hold each other accountable. When I see you trying to step out and undermine the work of your colleague, I need to speak to that and to raise us all up to a level where we recognize that we are very much in this thing together. And my interest is in not so much in blowing my horn, but in blowing the horn of all of us in the context of our collaboration. So that was my second reason that I am no ways tired. And there's another reason that I'm no ways tired. And this is uh, one of the most uh, critical lessons that I've learned. Uh, those of you who are practicing medicine know that you've got lots of stories to tell. And if you're a pediatrician, you have, if you don't have a story to tell, then you really didn't do a good job. I um, arrived um, at the end of what was a very frustrating day for me, just down the street at the South End Health Center. I had begun the day by uh, learning that one of my kids, who was a chronic asthmatic, had been hospitalized yet again. One of the reasons that his uh, asthma seemed so pernicious is because his family lived in a third floor walk-up that was both roach and rat infested. And uh, I began, as I had done many, many times before, that sort of calling, leaving messages for the landlord and really advocating that he really needed to do something different. I began my afternoon by identifying a little four-year-old girl who had um, been sexually abused by an uncle. And that's difficult enough, but again, those of us who practice pediatrics will we, we see these things. What was all the more difficult for me was that I was um, calling around to try to identify some place where this family could access some psychosocial support. And not, only, not even in my own clinic could I get some immediate help. The, the lists were so long that I was told that she would have to take a number. It would be a little bit while, a while. So you can imagine that by the time I got to my last patient, I was ready for Scotty to beam me up. And I walked in the room, and there was um, a 12-year-old girl um, named Maria. Maria had uh, immigrated from Guatemala the year earlier. And one of the things that I've learned about getting a, a sense of how well kids have assimilated to the country is I just speak English. Most kids, if they've spent any time uh, watching television and, uh, and fraternizing with their friends, they have a modicum of English. And, um, but she didn't speak. Her mother explained, explained to me that she was muy timida uh, and that, um, that, that she really wouldn't likely speak. I, I certainly understand about being muy timida. And so I dismissed her to uh, go behind the curtain and get dressed for our exam. Her mother and I continued to talk. Her mom said that she was a pastora. Uh, well, I, I'm a pastora as well. I, I pastor a congregation. Uh, and she marveled at that. So, okay, un medico y una pastora, yes. Um, and then she asked, well, are you married? Uh, yes, I'm married. And you have children? Yes, I have children too. And again, the whole package, you know, that you can wear multiple hats and have five different careers going at once was, uh, was a marvel to her. But I, I then went into my long whine about how difficult it is to help people, and don't nobody want to come alongside you and help you as you're trying to save the world. And as I continue to whine and lament, all of a sudden the curtain flies open, and now here is Maria, beautifully decked out in her blue paper gown. The thing that was so remarkable about Maria, she had her hand on her hip, she pointed to me, and she bobbed her head, and she said in letter-perfect English, you go, girl. <laughs> And I think that that is profound wisdom for we researchers who are very much committed to changing the face of the planet. And so there's good news. I told you about my little friend that I encountered, um, let's see if I do this, as I, that I encountered when I was in South Sudan. And this is, this is really good news and the thing that you do every day that must keep in front of you. 
So I, 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 I didn't know that there was anything that we could do. Again, I had no IV kit at my disposal. And, um, uh, and we're really, really out in the bush. But the people told me that there was a tuberculos tuberculosis clinic that was a couple of hours away that only took care of adults. And so obviously we have this two-week-old, so this is not going to work. But the truth is that I had nothing else to offer. No, either I was going to watch this baby die, or I was at least going to try to do something. So someone got a car, and they had some gas in it. This was an old, broken-down car. It wasn't clear at all to me that we were going to make it through the bush for the, uh, for the two hours that it would take to get to the car, get to the, to, to the clinic. And so I sat in the car and uh, saw this image, and uh, I just kept staring at this baby, kept staring at this baby, kept staring at this baby. And then I realized, well, you know, I don't have the IV, and I, you know, but I, there are a lot of things I don't have. But you know what? What I do have is some faith. And, and I don't know how, you, how any of us does this work that we do every day without having a modicum of faith. And so in that moment, I summoned forth my faith, and like Joyce said, I'm a praying woman. You get two for the price of one when you get me. And when I opened up my eyes, this is what I saw. And I thought, okay, okay, maybe we're going to be able to make it. So we continued on our trip. Uh, about an hour and a half into the journey, we came to this river. That might not be a big deal for you, but I do not swim. And we, this was a very rickety boat that had a hole in it that we were going to take. And I said, well, you know, I know God didn't bring me all the way over here to uh, drown. I could have drowned in Boston at Houghton's Pond. So, um, so we got in the boat, and uh, we crossed the river. And when we got to the other side, we had to do some more walking. But then we got to the clinic, and there was a, there was a, a, a doctor who didn't speak English, uh, and, and when I brought it, he said, well, we can't do anything. And so we rifled, rifled through all of this old, this old IVs, and we found one 25-gauge needle. And we recognized that if we didn't get this in, that we would have no other options, and pop. There it is. I had not put an IV in for 3,000 years. But here he is. And then when I left him, this is how he looked. This is what it's all about. This is why you do the things that you do. Um, the hope is to save hundreds and thousands, and that's what you're doing, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. But never lose sight of the fact that if you can just do one, if it just makes a difference for one, it has made all the difference in the world. So my message today, no ifs, no ands, no buts, just do it. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> And flowers, and it matches my outfit. I got the memo, or you got the memo. Sorry about the video. Oh, wow. Oh, you had to say something. Uh, well, we'd like to thank having Gloria here again as our keynote speaker. Um, I only was for the first half, but I was already like moved by this. Um, makes me want to change the world, too. <laughs> You're doing it. Yeah, and we all seen it, right? What's your name? Daryl. Daryl. Okay, is Daryl changing the world? Yes. Absolutely. Just do Thank it. You so Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs>